Uh, Stephanie, let me ask you, why did you decide to make this film? Uh, I uh, was with with Terry and, and, and Thomas when he was sick and dying, actually, after that last concert. And uh, I had no idea no idea who Thomas was except that he was my my brother-in-law at that time and I I knew he played jazz and uh, really that's about all I knew about him but when he passed away and I was in Rhode Island with Terry when this sad event happened uh, the next day we were driving around Rhode Island and I my sister was told that there was an obituary in the New York Times about Thomas, Thomas's passing. And so we went and looked for that obituary and at the same time NPR was playing a tribute, Boston NPR was playing a tribute to Thomas. So in my mind I thought, wow, this he must be somebody if he's got an obit in the uh, New York Times and NPR is playing his music. And I just sort of made a mental note that one of these days maybe a film should be made about him. So life went on and 15 years later I thought well uh, if we're gonna make a film about Thomas we should do it now because people's memories are gonna fade 15 years later uh, people are not gonna remember their stories as vividly and so uh, Terry agreed with me that a film should be made we checked with the Chapin family and they were all for it the first first thing we thought we had to do was make sure the family was fine about making the film. And then I started talking to people, calling up Mario and, and saying, I, I'm coming to New York. Uh, can we meet? I'd like to inquire about making a film about Thomas. And so Mario and I met, nine other people met uh, on a short trip to New York. And I asked them all the same question. Does Thomas Chapin deserve a film? And they all said, absolutely, absolutely, Thomas deserves a film. Uh, as a filmmaker, I can't make a film because he's my brother-in-law. I, I need reasons to make a film. I've, this is my 10th film, so I know I have to have a compelling idea. And from what I heard, when I asked them, okay, tell me why. Tell me why Thomas deserves a film. And I heard their answers. I, I, I thought, yeah, I've got to go ahead. So that was in... Uh, I think it was October of 2012 uh, that I, or no, no, it was, I'm sorry, it was May 2012 that I decided to go forth. Yeah, and uh, for uh, our viewers who don't know about the process of beginning a film, financing a film, producing a film, can you talk about uh, the reality of once you decided to make the film, how did you find the money and, and how did you produce it? <laughs> Well, I, I, it was interesting. We sent out letters to friends and everything, and we actually were able to raise quite a bit of money to keep it going until I got a major pot of money going. And uh, maybe raised about oh, $10,000 just from letters, people saying, yeah, we want this film, we want this film. And I was looking for that. I was looking to see, is there a will out there to make the film? I couldn't carry it financially myself. I know how to fundraise, but you need the early birds. You need that initial push uh, where people come and say, yeah, we want this, here's some money, keep going. And then the next thing I did was I started uh, a Kickstarter campaign, an online fundraising campaign, and that was launched in February 13th, uh, 2013 of this year. And February 13th was the day that Thomas died. And I just thought it was an appropriate day to launch the campaign. And 224 people came in a 45-day period. And we raised, uh, I was looking for to raise $50,000 to get the shooting started. And uh, in 45 days, I was able to raise $51,552 from 224 backers. And you're looking at, Ned and Mario, who are among the backers, of course, and many, many other people. And from that, I got a very strong sense. People were coming that knew Thomas, that had played with Thomas. Uh, I don't even know how they actually found 
out that I was on Kickstarter, except I kept uh, I kept Facebooking about it and sending out press release. So that that was the last thing I did fundraising. I'm now on a, another fundraising, attempting to raise the second uh, the money for the second shoot, which is needed. But that money got me to the place where I could do 20 interviews in high definition video. We filmed up in Hartford. We filmed in Manhattan, and from the and then also gathered archival footage. Uh, went down to Duke University, so that money really allowed me a, a huge push, a start, with which none of none of this would have been accomplished had the Kickstarter not succeeded. And it is a, it was an all or nothing deal. So with that money, we got started, shot 20 interviews, did the archival footage, and then the last thing I did was I hired an editor in Hollywood that specializes in movie trailers for documentaries. Hired him to do the trailer and it's a seven minute uh, seven minute trailer. It is up on the website www.thomaschapinfilm.com. Just go there. It's on the home page. You can watch it there. Excellent. And uh, Mario, when Stephanie contacted you about this film, uh, you jumped in immediately. Why do you think it's important to have a film about Thomas? Well, you know, you're 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 deep into your own music, 15 years later. Uh, but I, I, for for many years, I played Thomas's music, it, it, <coughs> including with my concerts and concerts. And then with Stephanie uh, Conti, uh, you know. I went back and had been a, a year or two before I really went back in there to Thomas's music, knew it so well, and listened to some recordings and, and um, looked at some of the music, and the recordings held up remarkably well, of course. Uh, he was an incredible player whose music still sounds pertinent. And, um, you know, it made, it may, it seems to me it's important to make this film because this film helps everyone not just the making of the film helping uh, you know a person like Thomas Chapin, a unique creator, but the whole scene, the whole scene from that time, the whole scene now, just this process that we're all in. So it's important when you lift w one person in a scene, you lift the scene, I think. And uh, as Larry Bloom says in the trailer, uh, who was this guy and where does music have gone? And it's certainly uh, a question I, I've thought about. Music still sounds well. That, that you you you, and, you bring um, up an interesting point. You know, uh, I think that when I think of Thomas Chapin, uh, when I first because heard because him and as he evolved over the years, he was a musician who kept changing. And uh, I, as with uh, many musicians who leave us, John Coltrane, uh, in particular, you wonder what might Thomas have, have gotten into. Where you know what future explorations? Because he left us at uh, at such an early age. What are your thoughts on that, Mario? When you when you guys were playing together, did you talk about the evolution of the music, yeah. or was it just a process? It was a process. I, I think you know, if I think about Thomas's two forces converging, his harmonic, uh, we had some things in common. I mean, he he loved the music. He loved standards. He loved uh, harmonic movement, and he constantly sought to break that, to go against that, to 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 destruct that and, and move on while still playing some of those. So I think it would have come together more, uh, started being entwined by one. Where would it be? I don't know. Uh, rhythmically, you know, I'm sure he would have passed through things where we are now and are going through, let's say, uh, uh, refer to an artist like Steve Cole, for example, a fair example, but then further, because it would be time. And uh, he was unique because he, his idiomatic playing, it, it, it was complete, and his energy playing was off the charts. He, he had more energy than any player, and it was fairly, fairly in, in focus energy, uh, let's yeah, say as opposed to somebody, some of the early this is on me, Albert Eiler or something. Uh, I mean, Thomas used to 
when we play all over the world, Thomas would literally make do vertical jumps three quarters of the way through his soles, a foot off the ground while he's playing vertical jumps. Incredible energy. So I think there was there was two things going on, and I'm, you know I, I'm sure he would have just continued to evolve with, with that 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 much and and uh, uh, skills going together. God knows. Yeah, just incredible. Stephanie, we've been talking about how uh, Thomas Chapin was such a unique man. How do you how do you convey that in a film? I mean, you have interviews, you have performance footage. Just how do you put that together to convey how unique Thomas Chapin was? Well, I think the key to the story are the memories of the musicians that he played with. It's also uh, the critics that wrote about him and followed him. Uh, there is some family history that the film will cover that are, that's important in the storytelling. But I feel it's the musicians that I have interviewed, and there are more musicians to interview, that really hold the key to understanding Thomas Chapin and his music. I can't tell you the jewels uh, that I have gotten from their stories and how it's going to make it so rich uh, that people who don't even know him are going to say, Wow, I'm glad I saw this film. I've got to, I've got to get to know his music. I've got to get to know him. He's he's worth getting to know, and that's my goal: is really to bring the audience to that place where they can say, "I want to know Thomas Chapin. I want to know about him. I want to hear his music. I want to understand him." And this is where the musicians come in. And I, again, I I tell you, their stories are just magnificent. I've I've done the interview with Ned. I've done the interview with Mario. Peter Madsen was another one, Mar Michael Serene, the drummer. I mean, there's more. There's more to do. But from the ones that I have done, I, I can't wait to make this film because it's so exciting to take what they have told me and to shape it into a film. So you're in the process. You've raved some money. You've done some production. How <coughs> much, how much, I mean, you've done some shooting. How much more shooting? How long will it take to edit? When can people expect to actually see the film? Well, I'm aiming for the end of the year, 2014 this year. If momentum can keep going like it has been going, I actually think I could finish this film by the end of the year or early 2015. And again, that's a big if because I have one more shoot to do in the spring. And, and if I can raise the money and, and find a way, I want to shoot in Europe the places that Ned and Thomas played, Mario and, and the trio played, those are really important places because people, people keep mentioning Perugia, people keep mentioning North Sea Jazz Festival, Montreux, uh, and a, a, a concert that the trio did in Portugal. And I need material to illustrate these stories that took place in Europe because they're great concerts that were put on at that time. So that would be the third shoot. If I'm able to accomplish all of that, third shoot would be in July, then I would go start going into the editing in August. I would hopefully find a, a way to get at least a rough cut by the end of 2014 this year. And then in early 2015, I would bring it to what we call a finishing editor and put all the final touches. But that's all contingent on raising the money needed for shoot two and the shoot three, if I could do it, and, and, and keeping on with this momentum that was started with the Kickstarter campaign. So uh, overall, what do you think the, the final budget for the film is going to be? Well, you know, my we have the like the the wish budget, which means all the bells and whistles, and uh, I, I I've I've made films for this much before, so I'm not put off by the figure of five hundred thousand dollars. The budget is actually four hundred ninety thousand dollars. That is the big budget, the wish budget, and then you know you also have the B budget. In case you can't raise all that money, you scale back and you do what you can with what you have. And I'm prepared to do that as well. Yes, so uh, we filmmakers have a way with working with budgets because we want to make a film. That's the reality of it. Talk a little bit about what's going to happen with the film. You're going to finish it. You'll either get your A budget or your B budget, maybe a combination of the two. Once the film is complete, Stephanie, what happens next? 
Well, I think the first thing that it should happen is that I should premiere the film in certain cities, including Hartford, New York, Honolulu, and, uh, I, and Phoenix is another place I've been talking this film up. Uh, there's some filming that has already happened in Phoenix with Marty Kahn, and I want to interview uh, a, a, a fellow named Rob Kaplan, who played with Thomas and Zassis uh, way back when. <clears throat> and uh, I wish to interview him at the Museum, Museum of Musical Instruments, which Thomas would have loved because he loved musical instruments and this is from all over the world. So those are the, the film will premiere at those cities and then I will take it on the film festival circuit and hopefully a distributor will see it and want it and start to put it up on distribution sites across the world. And that's Fantastic. television, basically yeah. television and film festivals in the world, jazz festivals. I'm, I'm going to go to the jazz festivals that are now, because there are so many films being made about jazz right now, we're in this flourishing of films about jazz and jazz artists, that jazz festivals are showing films, and they'll want this one. I, I'll tell you, they'll want this one. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of film, festival, uh, film festivals are going to want it. Uh, a lot of people... Uh, Love Thomas, and I'm I'm so glad Stephanie that you're doing a film so that uh, more people will know about this remarkable man and his music. And I know that uh, you've got a benefit coming up. I'm going to put the uh, graphic on the screen here. Uh, where did it go? The graphic disappeared. While I'm getting it up here, why don't you uh, tell talk tell us about the benefit? Where is it going to be? When is it? Who's going to be there? And so forth. Oh, are you asking me? Yes, you. Well, you know, I, I really think Ned or, or Mario, uh, Mario worked on the lineup, but the, it's going to be at City Winery in Manhattan on Varick Street on January 20th, and uh, it will benef benefit the film. And so, if, if, you know, if he, if he can make it there, it's going to be a tremendous evening of music. And, and Mario, maybe you could say something about the lineup. Ned, maybe you could say something about your participation and what you're looking forward to. Mario? Oh. Mario, would you like to say yeah, a few words I about mean, the I, um, Sure. It, it, it's on January 20th, as your poster there seems to indicate. And uh, interestingly enough, it's at the City Winery, which is uh, owned by Michael Dorf, who was the owner of the two previous knitting factories. And the first one is really where this story uh took shape uh, along with the stories of a lot of great musicians, Ned and Tim Byrne and, and so many people, uh, uh, Modesky and, and, and Bernstein and so forth. Uh, some of the guys that are going to be there for sure, uh, John Zorn and Ben Porowski will do a duo, um, Orrin Baldo and, and Jennifer Charles will do a couple of Thomas's unique pieces, Hat and Shoes and Fez, and it's really going to be fascinating to hear a vocalist and uh, a guitar player uh, adapt these tunes. Uh, I'm hoping to do some tunes of Thomas's and some tunes inspired by Thomas with a piano trio uh, with Gerald Cleaver and Craig Taborn. And then with Gerald and I will join uh, these great alto players, Marty Ehrlich, Ned Rothenberg, uh, tenor player Michael Blake, I'm hoping, and there's others there, um, to do some of Thomas' Astonato book, which is a, a large number of pieces the trio did that uh, had basic vamps. Um, Stephen Bernstein and Marcus Rojas, two-thirds of the original Sex Mob, are going to be there doing a duo. Poet Steve Delchensky will be there. Uh, a close friend of Thomas and collaborator Pablo Aslan, We'll do a tango piece that he uh, wrote for Thomas. Uh, Matt Wilson and Arthur Kell will go along and be kind of the second rhythm section with uh, Rudresh Manhan Tapa and Roy Nathanson and several others. So uh, quite a lineup in the film preview, which the newest seven-minute version will be shown. And it's really great uh, uh, to see this uh, preview. I really think this preview is incredible inspire people to see it and helps you uh, understand why the film should be made. Absolutely. Now, Ned, you've been around uh, New York City and uh, the jazz scene for some time. 
What is it about uh, these kind of events? What is the feeling when one participates in this kind of tribute benefit? Uh, well, uh, you know, it, I, it's funny sitting here and thinking about this event. I, I, um, I know that uh, uh, my feeling, I'm looking forward to it very much, but I think the fact that it's at this Michael Dorff's place and it's going to have a lineup which includes a lot of the folks who played at the last benefit for Thomas while he was still alive. Uh, um, there, was, there was a big gig at, 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 at the Knitting Factory uh, on Leonard Street. Um, with the, I remember Marcus Rojas and, and, and uh, uh, yes, Bernstein and Mario, and we were all there. And I remember Anthony Braxton in the audience just, uh, oh, oh, and he played, right, he played a piano piece because Thomas had recorded this stuff with him on piano. Um, uh, for me, uh, it's, it's always joyous to get together and celebrate somebody's life. Um, I have been around for a while, and I'm, 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 I'm hoping it's not too uh, uh, emotional. Uh, well, I know it will be emotional because, it, you know, it's been a long time, but I think for all of us, uh, uh, being there together and playing Thomas's music, um, well, it's it's great. It'll 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 put us back in touch then, and uh, but it also puts me back in touch with with you know we all have a, a huge sense of loss from this guy, as you were saying. Uh, uh, you know, you were asking Mario where he would have been, and I wouldn't make any prediction where he'd be today. But one thing that everybody shared was a feeling that that. That Thomas, he had, he had accomplished so much, but he was just taking off, and uh, um, uh, it, so it'll be what what you know. Whenever somebody that uh, uh, powerful uh, is is lost in such an untimely fashion, um, it'll be very very bittersweet, at least for me, and I, I think for a lot of us. Just because, boy, I would rather be uh, playing with him than. Uh, than, than just for him. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I for one, uh, wish that uh, Thomas was here right now joining us. Uh, Stephanie, once again, the website where people can look at the trailer and get more information about the film. Yeah, the website is www.thomaschapinfilm.com. Brad, I wanted to say something about Michael Dorff. This is his, this is his benefit. He is throwing it. It was his idea. He gave ten thousand dollars, our our biggest giver at Kickstarter.com. He wants to see this film made, and so I hope everybody will come out and support Michael and his cause. Come and support the film. It's going to be an exciting evening of music. I I can't wait myself. And uh, thank you for having us uh, today on your show. Okay, no problem. I apologize for our technical difficulties. Uh, somehow we did get the information out. Uh, <laughs> Go to the website, check out the film, and I want to thank uh, three very patient people who, who joined me today. Mario Pavone uh, from somewhere in the state of Florida, Ned Rothenberg in the borough of Brooklyn, and Stephanie Castillo in uh, Hawaii. And uh, tomorrow uh, at noon Eastern time, uh, a special tribute celebration of the man in the music, Horace Silver. I'll be joined by uh, some musicians who played with Horace, including... Randy Brecker, Larry Ridley, Alvin Queen, John Burr, and Todd Coleman. Thanks so much, and we'll see you tomorrow on The Hang.